pleasure to welcome back Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate. During his uh, really, what should be in other times, maybe, maybe in maybe in like a, a hypothetical times, a happy time uh, for you. But this is um, uh, June now is uh, rather for uh, imposing, foreboding. Um, it is the time where we start to get all of these Supreme Court decisions. Uh, welcome to the program, Mark. Thank you so much. Happy to be here in June, a waking nightmare of a month for me, but <laughs> never a paucity of topics to discuss. Um, let's talk about the last two big uh, rulings by the Supreme Court, and then maybe we can just at least mention like what, what you're looking for coming down the, the pike. Um, it was now, I guess it, it seems like a year ago, but it was two, two, about two weeks ago, uh, when the, uh, the Supreme court looked at Sackett V, uh, EPA. And I will say like, we're, we're going to talk about two cases where, um, it, the, the worst possible case scenario wasn't quite achieved, but it feels like it's building towards that. But let's talk about this. What was the Sackett v. EPA about? Yeah, so this was the culmination of a decades-long fight um, by industry to gut a really important provision of the Clean Water Act that protects wetlands. Um, so the Clean Water Act has a provision that specifically says it doesn't just protect large bodies of water like lakes and rivers and streams. It also protects wetlands that are adjacent to those larger bodies of water. Important word there, adjacent. Um, and so the fight for many years has been uh, developers trying to fill in, destroy, build on wetlands that are near a larger body of water, but not directly touching it. They are neighboring, say, a lake or a river or a stream. The EPA has generally uh, tried to protect those wetlands um, because, you know, not only does adjacent mean next to, not connecting, um, but they serve a really important purpose, which was the whole reason Congress added this provision. Um, they serve a purpose of flood control. They help to purify water as it's coming into those larger uh, rivers and streams. Um, they help uh, reduce sediment damage, especially as climate change increases. Um, there are all kinds of benefits to us as people who drink and swim in water by preserving wetlands that are near the lakes and rivers that uh, we are used to, you might say. Um, and, 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 so and they do. I mean, the, the point of it being adjacent is because it's for protection of those major water, of, of those major bodies of water. I mean, in the final analysis, like that's, they're, they're not, I don't know that any, really any part of the planet is disconnected from another in, in, in most respects, but they are so not disconnected as to implicate each other. Yeah, yeah, they're intimately connected. I mean, the point of protecting wetlands in this law is not actually just to protect the, the ecosystem of a wetland. It is to protect the rivers and streams and lakes that are important for us as humans to be able to drink from and swim in. Um, and, you know, I could spend hours now quoting you all of these scientific studies about how when there's wetlands near a larger body of water, the water that is ultimately ends up in our uh, uh, systems and cities uh, is purified. It's much uh, higher quality. There's more protection because you know nature has actually figured out how to do this and how to filter water before it gets to um, the urban settings uh, and pipes that you know bring the water directly to our homes. Um, and so what this case asked was basically, if a wetland is next to a large body of water, but it's not directly touching it on the surface. So there might be an underground connection and there might be a part-time seasonal connection, but if it's not constantly directly flowing into that larger body of water so much so that it's indistinguishable, is it still protected? And by a five to four vote, the Supreme Court said no. And it basically said no by rewriting the law and saying, look, we understand that adjacent to does not mean connecting. You know, two houses in a suburb may be adjacent to each other because they are next door. They are not connected to one another. There is space between them. Uh, but the court basically said, well, if we, if we choose that reading, we will hurt a lot of property owners' feelings. We will prevent a lot of development on wetlands that industry wants to develop. And so we are going to choose not 
to honor Congress's words and instead replace the word adjacent with something like continuously touching and connected to. And in doing so, probably took more than 50% of wetlands in this country outside of the scope of EPA protection in one fell swoop. And that is going to have really bad spillover effects for us, for people who need to drink water, which is every human being on the planet. I, I just want to linger on that point for a second. The fact that this was codified into legislation by Congress in 1977 to make the EPA's rule on this stronger. This is exactly what the Supreme Court says they don't want to be engaged in. And yet they are undercutting it. Like the, the, the way that the right wing kind of positions itself in attacking the administrative state is like, well, then let, let's just put it through the legislature, right? But it did go through the legislature and they're still being judicially activists, which I think is really key to understanding this case. Yeah. And, and of all people, Justice Brett Kavanaugh made that case really well. Um, <laughs> he he did not agree with the five justices in the majority. And he went through this history. And basically what happened is Clean Water Act is passed in the early 70s. There's a huge debate about whether wetlands are protected if they are adjacent to a larger body of water or if only if they're directly touching a large body of water. Army Corps of Engineers drafts up a regulation that says it's fine as long as they're adjacent. Congress codifies that regulation into law, into the statute we're talking about now. And almost half a century later, the Supreme Court comes along and says, and I'm really not exaggerating here. The court says, you know, we just don't think that that's a legitimate goal of Congress. You know, if Congress wanted to do that, it would have had to be much, much clearer, even though it's, you know, as clear as you could possibly get in the text. And even then, we think it might lead to some kind of unconstitutional intrusion on the rights of states and landowners. And that gets to your point, Sam, at the, at the outset, that this was bad, but not as bad as it could be. Clarence Thomas, and Neil Gorsuch have this whole separate opinion where they say, well, we don't think the court goes far enough. We basically want to strike down the entire Clean Water Act because we don't think a body of water can be protected by the federal government unless it has not only a clear interstate connection, but it is used as a means of continuous transportation of goods between multiple states. And otherwise, the federal government has no ability to protect it. That's what they said. The court didn't adopt that position, but like maybe that's going to be the next case. I mean, that's there's in uh, it, it, just I want to I want to circle back to that. But there seems to be I mean, aside from like, you know, where you have uh, Gorsuch and Thomas basically saying like they don't have the authority to do this, like basically saying the, the federal government does not have the ability to protect these uh, th this range of 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 where of water essentially of our yeah. environment they don't they just don't under no circumstance they have it 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 also seems impossible to imagine how Congress could have written a law that would have covered these things I mean if we accept that 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 the federal government does have the ability to protect our water uh, and you know, our air is probably, you know, next on the docket. But it do, if we if we accept that fact, if they so choose to, it's impossible to imagine how Congress could have written this to cover what they wanted to cover, because adjacent means adjacent. Like there's no there's no other magic formula that you could say. Like I suppose you could say you could say twenty miles or within five miles of any body of water that is. Uh, a certain has a certain amount of cubic water in it or something like that, but it would be impossible for them to get at what they wanted to do, which is to protect these major waterways. Um, because we, you know, if it's uphill as opposed to downhill, I mean, it, it, there's too many factors associated with it. You have to leave it to the experts. Um, and, and like you say, Alito said, we need to see it. Essentially, you need to be able to like, ride a canoe uh, between these two bodies of water. And if you can't do it, then it doesn't count. Um, yeah, and if case in case the text weren't enough, you have this whole legislative history and all these findings by Congress where there were sand dunes, there were berms, there were man-made dikes separating a wetland from a waterway. And Congress looked at that and said, yes, we want to protect those wetlands. And now 50 years later, the Supreme Court just says, no, you can't. Okay, so... The the other f uh, thing, I mean, aside from like the, the idea that Thomas feels that the, the federal government shouldn't have the ability to do any of this, uh, 
the um, where does w- was this a case where you could have possibly seen either like sort of a an attack uh, on sh- the Chevron doctrine or on the notion of deference? Because it feels like mm. there was no explicit attack on those uh, doctrines, but in 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 actuality, it was an attack on that doctrine. So I, I totally agree that it was because one of the things the the court said in this decision was we're overriding everything the EPA has ever said about this under Republican and Democratic presidents. We're just stepping in and imposing our own definition and saying EPA, you know, you don't get to do this. Um, but I think the the reason the court sidestepped a direct attack on something like Chevron deference is that the Clean Water Act rules are very much in flux. And this is like my favorite sort of sorted underbelly of this case. The Supreme Court stepped in toward the beginning of Joe Biden's presidency when Biden's EPA tried to repeal the Trump regulations, because, of course, Trump's EPA had come in and said, we don't care about water. We don't care about wetlands. The the the, um, the whole mission under Trump was to allow as much pollution and destruction as possible. So Biden comes in, his EPA tries to change the rules and actually Im- implement the Clean Water Act as written. The Supreme Court steps in and reimposes Trump's rule on the Biden administration and on the EPA. So the Supreme Court issues in April of 2022 a shadow docket order with no explanation by a five to four vote that simply says we are reimposing Trump's Clean Water Act rule on the federal government until further notice. And so the court already had the EPA operating under the previous president's ridiculous regulations. The rule is so in flux and has been so kind of captured by the courts already. I don't think they needed to take that step of talking about deference because they they just did whatever the hell they wanted. I mean, why did they, are they waiting for another case? I mean, because they've been sort of teeing up this attack on deference. And just to be clear, so that people know, deference is just sort of this principle that when courts are faced with an agency's making a determination as to how best to fulfill their mission as um, as as sort of uh, uh, you know required by or mandated by Congress, we defer to the agency because that's where all the scientists are. That's where the people, the experts are, and we're just not as as expert at this. They've been sort of swimming around like sharks around that doctrine, and in this instance, it seemed like an opportunity for them to to deal with the doctrine, but they they didn't mention it, but they were like almost just putting it in practice. Mm. Yeah, well, and they've been doing that for a long time. You know, the Supreme Court has not invoked deference to agencies in years. It is not using Chevron deference. It's just pretending like it's already been overruled. I think the court wanted to do something different in this case. I think the court's goal with this case was to basically tell federal agencies, you know, even if your mandate is clear, even if Congress has given you a very explicit goal, uh, we're not going to let you do it if we don't like it. If we think that it's too harmful to property owners or to developers or to states, we're not going to let you implement this rule. And that's a kind of different goal from overturning Chevron deference, which is another way. I mean, it's very similar, but it's another way for the court to overrule agencies by overruling their scientific expertise and saying, yeah, you think that wetlands protect water, as you know, they might have said in this case, but we disagree and we know science better than you do. The court has teed up a a decision to overrule Chevron deference next term. I think it just had a a slightly different aim with this case. Okay. All right. Let's move to... um... Uh, another case. I mean, we, you know, we're going to I I think we're going to be feeling the implications of this case for, I don't know, decades now. Uh, 50 percent of the wetlands gone uh, to will be opened up essentially to development uh, without regard as to the damage it's going to do to our water supply, to the ecosystems of other large bodies of water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let's move on to uh, Glacier Northwest versus Teamsters. Um, this is another one that could have been worse, much, much worse. Yeah. Well, could have been, I don't know. You characterize it cause I feel it's bad, but it's, it, 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 and, and I think it, it, it is a, you know, a sign of things to come. Uh, but it's not as bad as it could have been. Yeah, it could have been catastrophic and instead it was just 
awful. Um, that's how I would put it. You know, this is a case that was teed up as a direct challenge to the federal right to strike, which is something that the uh, New Deal protected very vigorously. Um, we passed the National Labor Relations Act, which guarantees employees the right to uh, organize collectively and go on strike um, when they see fit. Um, and one of the key safeguards here is that the federal law that protects the right to strike generally supersedes any state level efforts to punish a union for organizing a strike. So that sounds very abstract, but think about it this way. If states uh, could, could allow their laws to be used against unions every time there's a strike, then the, uh, the employer would simply walk into a state court at the beginning of a strike and slap the union with a million different lawsuits, negligence, recklessness, conspiracy, fraud, trespassing, destruction of property, whatever. And they would just drown the union in lawsuits that would prevent the union from ever striking in the future and from organizing an effective strike. Um, that is how unions basically worked before this law and it was a, a nightmare. So the federal law says not only do unions have this right to strike, but the federal government generally supersedes state authority to uh, attack unions as long as that strike is arguably protected by federal law. So as long as the workers are engaging in a kind of conduct that is arguably legal and arguably protected, they cannot be slapped with civil suits. Their unions cannot be slapped with civil suits. It is the National Labor Relations Board of the federal government that has jurisdiction. They step in when there are complaints, they resolve unfair labor charges. They are the ones who deal with this because again, otherwise unions couldn't function. They would just drown in lawsuits all the time. So this is a case about uh, truckers. They drive the cement trucks that you see on the on the streets. Um, they decided to go on strike. Their uh, employer would not come to an agreement at the bargaining table. They went on strike after their trucks had been filled with cement. Um, and they brought the trucks back. They did not try to destroy the trucks. They didn't try to destroy the cement, but the cement was ultimately ruined because uh, the strike had sort of lengthened the timeline. And by that point, the cement was too hard to be of use. So and the employer- Clear. They they left the they left the truck spinning. I mean, it, they left you know, the truck spinning. The drums were running. The employees did everything that they could to protect this cement. Right. The employee they took the trucks back. They let them running. Um, the, the, they just couldn't protect the cement because it's a very very tricky business and it hardens very fast. So the employer steps in and sues the union and says, you organized this strike and this strike destroyed my property. And the Washington courts say, well, this is not a case for us. You know, this is a, a question for the National Labor Relations Board, because clearly this conduct was at least arguably protected by federal law. And the Supreme Court reverses by an eight to one vote. And the Supreme Court says that what the truckers did in this case, their strike was clearly illegal and not even arguably protected because they failed to take reasonable precautions to protect their employer's property. And because of the lack of those precautions, they open themselves and their union up to state level lawsuits and they get no protection from federal labor law. And only Justice Katanji Brown Jackson dissented from that decision, which I thought was a pretty big shock. OK. All right. So uh, I want to go through the sort of like the two different, you know, the 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 Coney Barrett uh, um, authored uh, decision and the sort of like a a join uh, adjoining uh, you know decision in favor of the of the same outcome I want to get to that in a minute but the how does like how, there it's it, it seems like it's it, there this is um there's no way to get around like it seems like in every instance because of this you'll be able to sue a a union in state court because if you're ignoring the arguability that this was not a problem, like, right. I mean, the way that this should have gone is the, the state court goes, we don't have jurisdiction here because it's not obvious what they did. You know, it's a question of is leaving a cement in a cement truck spinning around like this, you know, like completely reckless. And, uh, uh, you know, as opposed to, we took the trucks and we hid them and we didn't tell you where we left them. Like I, we, we went on strike en route to the job and where the truck is you're gonna have to find out that to me seems like okay you're really uh being reckless with this but this is arguable 
right? I mean, like it's written into the law. Like what is arguable? Well, whether it's, you know, not a slam dunk. And in this instance, it wasn't a slam dunk. That the, NL, the National Labor Relations Board could have found like, yeah, we don't like this or whatnot. But we talk about the other cases like milk and cheese and stuff like this that have set the precedent that this is judged against. And had they found that it was arguable, they would have in, inhibited the, the state court case going forward. And the National Labor Relations Board would have made a determination. Yeah. And to be clear, you know, the National Labor Relations Board has already stepped in here and accepted the charge of an unfair labor practice. And something that Justice Jackson says that I think is clearly right is if the NLRB thinks that there is something here, that there's smoke here, that should be enough to say that this is arguably protected because they're the experts and the ones tasked with doing this under under the federal law, not us. Um, but to your to your broader point, you know, there are all of these cases involving perishable goods like milk and cheese and yogurt and fruits and whatever that are in the hands of someone who is shipping them to their final destination. The shippers go on strike and ultimately the cheese or milk or whatever spoils and is useless. And in all of those cases, both the NLRB and the courts have found that those strikes were protected. And they found that because the whole point of a strike is to hurt your employer's bottom line to show them how valuable you are as a worker and to force them to come to the table and negotiate. Like the purpose of a strike is to make your employer feel the pain and the burn of you walking off the job and really using the leverage that you have as a cog in their machine to force them back to the table. And Justice Jackson has this great section where she says, you know, employees are not indentured servants. Employers are not their masters. Like they do not owe free labor to their to their companies like they get to strike under federal law. And if that leads to the destruction of, of some products, whether it's milk or cheese or cement, that's how it works. That is the choice that Congress made when it passed the National Labor Relations Act. And the court just totally chucks that principle. This is the majority opinion. There's a five justice majority opinion by Amy Coney Barrett. She just chucks that principle and she says, well, we're not going to credit the truckers for refusing to steal their employer's property. You know, yeah, they could have driven the trucks away. They could have hidden the trucks. They could have destroyed the trucks. But, you know, we're not going to credit them for not doing that. They also should have refused to load the cement into their trucks, knowing there was a chance, a chance that they would go on strike and the cement would be ruined. And that just has it backward from all of the case law, from the actual statute. That is not how strikes work. That is not how the right to strike works. And so this is a real blow to workers' ability to actually collectively strike when state courts are going to open themselves up to endless lawsuits filed against unions saying, well, you didn't take the right precautions, so now we're going to bankrupt you. And, and, and it's going to expand what taking the right precautions means, right? Yeah. I mean, it could be like, you you um you know you decided to strike in uh late november christmas is the season in which we make all our money and you did not take the precautions you know you should have stroke is, is striked in june because christmas is when we make our year and that's not fair <laughs> that was kind Absolutely. of the justification for by the way the rail like breaking the rail strike a little bit because it was just too crazy of a time but the, i mean i would imagine that they employ that kind of thought going forward legally which is what's concerning. someone's gonna someone's gonna test it right i mean that's what's gonna happen next this is is some employer is going to or some you know uh, the american enterprise institute or the heritage foundation or whatever that legal entity is is gonna find a plaintiff who's gonna try and make that argument uh you know at, at one point or another yeah. And, and, you know, this case comes out of Washington state, which has like the bluest courts in the country and very good labor laws. Imagine what happens when this fact pattern plays out in Texas or Florida or a state with terrible labor laws. Like this is a real existential threat to unions in a way, because any grocery worker, rail worker, retail worker, whatever, you know, you could, we could go down the list. Like there's always some reason why they shouldn't strike at this moment because it'll hurt their employer's bottom line. And what Justice Jackson says that the majority just rejects is that's the point of a strike. And if we take that away, then the right to strike no longer exists under federal law. All right. I, uh, I want to get into the, uh, the aspect of uh, Katanji uh, um, uh, Brown was the um, was the lone dissenter, but there were two uh, there were sort of two camps in the decision, and um, Sotomayor and Kagan uh, 
signed on to the Amy Coney Barrett uh, decision. Will you just sort of like parse that out for us? Like what those two camps in, you know, who all signed on to the outcome of the case uh, versus sort of like the reasoning behind the case and what the implications of that are? Right. So the majority, Amy Coney Barrett, along with Sotomayor, Kagan, Roberts and Kavanaugh, they take what the media called a middle ground or a compromise where they zero in on reasonable precautions and say, you know, this is just a case about how they didn't take reasonable precautions. So they weren't arguably protected. So let a thousand lawsuits bloom. Um, Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito are off in a kind of separate world where they say, yeah, we definitely want to stick it to the union here, but we would also like to overturn all of the precedent that protects strikes as long as they are arguably protected and dramatically cut back on the amount of federal safeguards that we have for striking workers and their unions and really make it so that unless a, a union's conduct is 100% obviously protected from the start, that state courts can open their doors to lawsuits, which is not an, a way to actually like I implement the National Labor Relations Act. It, it goes against the text and like a century of precedent. Um, and it means if put into effect that unions are going to get slapped with endless suits because, you know, it's you can never prove that something is obviously clearly 100 percent protected. That is a fact bound, nuanced issue that has to be resolved usually by the National Labor Relations Board. So they just want to remove all of these protections. The majority wants to remove like half of the protections. And I think that's why Kagan and Sotomayor joined the majority, because the alternative would have been much worse than this. How I mean, in practice, like, how is this going to work? In other words, like in the next case, and uh, okay, I I own um, you know I, I own a, a a five and dime, and my workers strike. Like I say, it's before Christmas. This is when I make all my money uh, for the year. You know, the rest of the year is basically a wash, and then I make my my profit. In, in which is the case in retail for a lot of uh, outfits. And I say they did not use. I'm going to sue them. Because they did not use enough uh, caution in terms of like my uh, business. Like this is really costing me a lot. Uh, this is my one time of the year. I go to state court and then like what? What does the does the case continue or does the state court kick it up into the, the federal system? Or does the National Labor Relations Board have a, have a, a, a means in which to say, no, this is argument like what? This seems to like open up a Pandora's box. Right. So, it, I mean, it used to be and it should be that if the National Labor Relations Board uh, proceedings are suspended until the board can come to a conclusion and, and conduct an investigation. And to be clear, case, in, in Northwest, the, the, the National Labor Relations Board did step in. It is and is investigating and has been investigating and doing something entirely separate from from this litigation. And what this decision says is none of that matters, that if the National Labor Relations Board general counsel steps in and says, we think this was arguably protected, we're embracing this unfair labor charge, we're launching an investigation, like it's unclear if that should have any bearing at all on a state court's decision to allow or disallow um, a civil suit against a union. This is a very much an open question in the case. And how I personally think that this is going to cash out is that it's going to help Republican appointed general counsels to the board stick it to unions even more. Because I think what we're going to see is, you know, the next Republican president will fire the general counsel on day one and put in some horrible anti-union, um, you know, management side lawyer as the as the general counsel of the NLRB. He is going to start just handing out uh, filings that say, I don't think this was arguably protected. Go at it in the state courts. I don't think that this conduct was protected by federal law. Let a thousand lawsuits bloom. I think what this does is empower the general counsel to make it easier for suits against unions to move forward in state courts, but doesn't really empower a liberal general counsel to stop those those state lawsuits. It's kind of a one way ratchet, if that makes sense. Well, c could you view this in the same vein as other uh efforts to undercut the administrative state and i know it's different than the epa like the epa is essentially like issuing decrees on environmental protection and this is more of like a separate body that adjudicates labor law but in the same way these this is the supreme court overriding these agencies that have been around for decades at this point tasked with these exact uh issues 
and saying, no, we know best and we're imposing this and weakening you in the process. Yeah, I, I would say this is an attack on the National Labor Relations Board when it is in Democratic hands. When Democrats are running the board and the general counsel is a Democrat, this gives state courts pretty clear authority, although the, the bounds are kind of blurry, the court didn't fully resolve this issue, but some authority at least to ignore what the board is saying, to ignore the general counsel and to open the doors to lawsuits. But then again, when the board flips into Republican hands, I think it's going to give the general counsel a tool to say to really lobby in these cases and say, we don't think this was even arguably protected so the lawsuits can go forward. So yes, it's an attack on the administrative state, it's an attack on the board's authority and the general counsel, but as as with so many of these attacks on the administrative state, it only really kicks in, I think, during a Democratic presidency. And as soon as you have Republicans running the show again, the court is probably going to step back and say, wield this power however you like. Uh, so because the, there's no real like definitional or limiting principle on no. uh, uh, on on the on where the the state court can't sort of like intervene. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no. Because, I mean, well, how much more, if it's, like, there's really no other answer, right? I mean, it's arguable or it's not arguable. I mean, even not arguable is sort of hard to sort of, like, establish. The idea was that Congress wanted to give the National Labor Relations Board wide, wide authority under this to make this assessment and not in any other place because they wanted to have one clearinghouse. And so just about everything is arguable, but if, if you start saying this is not arguable, we, it's imp like it's you know it's definitionally arguable because the National Labor Relations Board is arguing about it right now. I mean, it's it's like it, they have destroyed the capacity again. It seems to me of Congress, even though I don't you know we don't have a Congress that would do this at this point, but they have destroyed the capacity of Congress to sort of make decisions on this. Yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree. And, and the point you just made is exactly what Justice Jackson said and said, this should have been the beginning and the end. It's definitionally arguable if the clearinghouse for all labor disputes thinks that it is arguable. And so this is yet another case of courts filled with non-experts and partisans and ideologues stepping in and saying, we know better than these members of the you know, administrative state, which is apparently so dangerous, even though the administrative state answers to the president who we get to kick out of office. These justices are on the bench for life. We can't do anything about it. And yet they are claiming that the separation of powers and principles of democratic accountability requires them to be the final decision makers in all of these disputes. All right. So um, we, we, we've had a, uh, you know, you've had uh a not catastrophic but a really unpleasant so far june um what uh what do you anticipate is going to make you feel worse in the next in the coming weeks so the court will definitely overturn affirmative action um i think there's really no question there um i'll be looking for exactly how far it goes in the majority opinion you know whether clarence thomas is writing it or whether roberts is writing it but they're going to overturn it in principle um, the court's going to allow at least some measure of anti-gay discrimination among business owners in the 303 creative case and say that business owners have a First Amendment right to ignore non-discrimination law and discriminate against uh, gay customers when there's some kind of expressive conduct involved. Um, I, I think the court is probably going to do another attack on the Voting Rights Act and eviscerate Section 2 even further and make it impossible for federal courts to protect black communities in red states and stop red states from gerrymandering them into oblivion and diluting their votes. Um, and I think maybe the only silver lining is that the big election case, the independent state legislature case out of North Carolina, will probably get tossed because the North Carolina Supreme Court flipped from Democrat to Republican and overruled its own decision. So we'll be spared that horrible decision for at least some period of time. But I think in the other big cases, we are in for an extremely rough June. I would say a bad June is rising. Uh, and you didn't even mention the student debt case, which is also, I think, going to be, uh, I mean, not it's... optimistic. And this, the, the standing analysis in that case is going to be absolutely atrocious and make us all want to light our hands on fire because clearly these plaintiffs don't have standing. But when the yeah. court wants to do something, it just does it. Uh, and the standing being that there's no to prove to essentially come and sue uh, for relief. You need to prove that you're being harmed.
and they, it, 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 the the universality of understanding that these these uh, plaintiffs are not harmed is is pretty stunning. Uh, yep. it, I, I mean. We, we will end up talking about that when this comes down. But uh, and, and so I have a feeling we'll be touching base with you again uh, this June to uh, to have you, I guess, bathe more in your misery. And really. <laughs> and, but but all of ours. Yeah. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. this is this was um, predictable and it is uh, it, it really is like watching a slow motion train wreck. And because the. The moment that uh, Donald Trump won the election, this was there was a high I don't know if a high probability, but a, certainly a probability that he would have the opportunity to, you know, shift the court, at, you know, in, in this way. Six, three is a big difference between five, four. And uh, once that uh, once RBG uh, died. And yeah. they were able to slam in a uh, a new justice within three weeks from the election. It, it's just a matter of, of time. And we're going to just see more and more of the degradation of what we sort of all grew up understanding about the role of government was in our society completely uh, turned on its head. Yeah. Uh, unless the court changes hands, it will only keep getting worse every single June. I'm I'm sad to say. <laughs> And and just to Sam's point really quickly, the fact that Coney Barrett is writing a lot of these majority opinion, opinions just puts into stark relief how the Democrats completely bungled this opportunity. Um, and like she was the she was the one right that that replaced uh, RBG. So um, thanks for being our pain sponge, Mark. We appreciate it. <laughs> Happy to soak it up. Mark Mark <laughs> Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate. Thanks again, buddy. Thanks.